Mount Sinai uh, uh, Medical Center in Miami, Florida, and will discuss the results of the trial to assess chelation therapy known as TACT. Um, thank you very much, uh, Elliot. As always, uh, a pleasure. Uh, we've known each other since 1978, just as a, an irrelevant detail. Um, I'm actually um, honored to be able to present the results of the trial to assess chelation therapy on behalf of my co-investigators and, uh, and co-authors. I will run through the slides uh, uh, quite quickly and um, uh, afterwards, I presume that there will be uh, opportunity uh, for us to interact. I, I, I should have mentioned that there's an updated slide file that's available to you electronically, and these are the ones that Dr. Lamas is going to actually be showing. You have a copy of uh, a set that was submitted just before that one. I will. Um, the background of chelation therapy, I think, is uh, fairly well known to most people here. Um, EDTA binds divalent cations and permits renal excretion of those divalent cations. In 1956, Clark reported a series of patients with successful treatment of angina. From 1956 to the present, that is 56 years, the use of chelation therapy has increased uh, to over 100,000 patients annually in the U.S. Um, in a 2007 survey. Case reports and case series have been published, uh, reporting benefit. Small clinical trials um, tended to be negative for surrogate endpoints. And there is evidence of harm, especially from rapid infusions that may cause hypocalcemia. The TAC timeline begins in 2001, all the way on the left, when an RFA, again a peer-reviewed RFA that went through NHLBI and NCAM Council, uh, was released. Uh, we applied, and TACT was funded as a cooperative agreement with NHLBI and NCAM as part of the investigative team. Obtained from the Food and Drug Administration. The first patient was randomized in 03. The 134th site was activated um, in 09. There were 1,708 patients enrolled by uh, 2010, and the last follow-up was about a year ago. The design overview for TACT um, is as follows. It's really a, a factorial design. And this factorial design um, splits the study into four cells, chelation or chelation placebo, that is infusions or infusion placebo, and high-dose vitamins versus oral high-dose uh, vitamin placebos, identical placebos. The study was double-blinded and the um, uh, study therapy was delivered to the sites um, by a central pharmacy. There were 40 infusions um, required of each patient. Each infusion lasted at least three hours, 30 weekly, and then another 10, two to eight weeks apart. The reference at the bottom is the design paper. Eligibility, um, patients were age 50 or older, uh, they'd had an acute myocardial infarction at least six months before, and the creatinine uh, was two or less. You can see the other uh, entry criteria. The chelation infusion, if you stay with the top two lines, um, had three grams of EDTA ba adjusted downward based on estimated GFR, and seven grams of ascorbic acid, um, again, delivered intravenously. Then there were electrolytes, some B vitamins, local anesthetic, unfractionated heparin, and then sterile water to complete 500 milliliters. The placebo infusion was normal saline and 1.2% dextrose, 500 milliliters. The primary endpoint was death, MI, stroke, coronary revascularization, and hospitalization for angina. The original plan was to randomize 2,372 patients and follow up a minimum of one year, 85% power for detecting a 25% difference. In 2009, due to slow enrollment, uh, we asked for a reduction of the total sample size to 1,700, understanding that we would 
not take a loss in statistical power because of the increased uh, follow-up um, uh, time. And because of this, uh, the DSMB approved our request. Treatment comparisons were as randomized, that is, intent to treat. There was two-sided statistical testing. The log rank test was used um, using time to first event. Interim monitoring using alpha spending function with O'Brien Fleming monitoring boundaries. And because of the length of the study with 11 DSMB reviews to ensure safety, the final level of significance was 0 0.036. Um, I have a different version of this slide for the presentation this afternoon for those of you who will be there. Let me just point out, uh, I know it doesn't project um, uh, well. Let me point out the median age is 65. Patients are either obese or overweight uh, on the whole. Uh, over 30% were diabetics. Over 80% had had a prior revascularization. Over 70% were on statins and beta blockers. And over 80% were on aspirin. So patients were on um, reasonable uh, evidence-based medicine post myocardial infarction. We delivered a total of 55,222 infusions. 65% of patients completed all 40, 76% completed at least 30. And then there were um, reasons for discontinuing the infusions. Consent was withdrawn by 17% of patients at some point during the course of the study. 79 patients discontinued infusions due to adverse events or side effects. Um, and you can read this. Um, there were four unexpected severe adverse events, possibly or defini definitely related to study therapy, two in the placebo group with one death, and two in the chelation group, again, with one death. This is the primary endpoint results. As you can see, there is a significant difference uh, favoring chelation therapy in the primary endpoint of death, MI, stroke, coronary revascularization, or hospitalization for angina. The hazard ratio is 0 0.82, the confidence intervals are 0 0.69 to 0 0.99, and the p-value is 0 0.035. The components of the primary endpoint, I would like to just uh, take your eye to those uh, components that are non-mortal, uh, or those, com those components that are uh, not death, and look at the hazard ratio. The hazard ratio is very much in line with the primary endpoint. Uh, death, there was no evidence that we were able to reduce um, total mortality, although the statistical power to do so um, was low. There were some subgroups that were analyzed, um, and these were all pre-specified subgroups. What I am giving you here is the P for interaction with treatment group assignment. Um, and it's important to note that time from MI to enrollment, um, there was no interaction with the treatment group assignment. Uh, whether the site that enrolled the patient was a chelation site or a conventional site, that is a site that practiced conventional cardiology versus one that was already practicing chelation therapy, that did not interact with um, the, with the uh, treatment assignment. Oral vitamins or placebo, remember it was a factorial design, again, did not interact. And my location did have an interaction um, with uh, treatment assignment, and diabetes did as well. This curve on the left shows the uh, patients with diabetes, 31%. Again, it's a small uh, subset of patients, and so we must look at this in a very cautious way. Um, but again, this uh, brings up the interaction with, of, di of diabetes with uh, treatment group assignment. There are a number of caveats in interpretation uh, that we absolutely must keep in mind. The final adjusted statistical significance means predefined significance, but the upper confidence interval for the hazard ratio of the primary endpoint was 0 0.99. While the relative treatment effect was similar for all the non-fatal components of the primary endpoint, revascularization was the most common outcome event. 
and 17% of patients withdrew consent, resulting in some missing data. We conclude that study therapy within the safety net provided by TACT appears to be safe. The 10-component disodium EDTA chelation and ascorbate regimen showed some evidence of a potentially important treatment signal in post-MI patients already on evidence-based therapy. However, however, our findings are unexpected and additional research will be needed to confirm or refute our results and explore possible mechanisms of therapy. TACT does not, at this time, constitute sufficient evidence to recommend the clinical application of chelation therapy. Thank you very much, Dr. Lamas. Uh, obviously, an important and controversial study that we're going to need to discuss and to start us in that discussion, I'd like to invite Dr. Paul Armstrong, uh, who's a professor of medicine at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Antman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a privilege for me to uh, comment on this uh, important and uh, interesting work. Here are some disclosures published on our website at the University of Alberta Vigor Center. <clears throat> to suggest that uh, this study is steeped in history or, or controversy would be an underestimate. And uh, as depicted here from uh, a report uh, published in 2002, on the one hand, it's been suggested that chelation therapy is valuable, effective, and safe. And uh, the other poll of opinion suggests that it's un it likely unsafe, certainly ineffective, and should be abandoned. So there has been no lack of controversy uh, on this uh, subject. We owe uh, Dr. Lamas and his colleagues uh, a debt of uh, gratitude uh, for their willingness to undertake uh, this uh, important subject and their determination to see it through and bring it to us today. Uh, this slide, which uh, was meant to be animated, uh, will be difficult for you to read. In fact, uh, I'm having trouble uh, reading uh, the, uh, the yellow uh, te uh, uh, text, but uh, the fact of the matter is that it's been increasing in use in the United States uh, to over 100,000 uh, per year at last estimates. Uh, it's expensive and out of pocket, uh, approximately $5,000 uh, for uh, each patient uh, to see a course of therapy. And the trial uh, uh, has also recognized that uh, it imposes a significant burden on patients uh, and has the potential for serious side effects. The trial itself uh, has been challenging in operation with an original 36-month period of enrollment that has gone uh, seven plus years. And uh, Dr. Lamas provided a progress report in 2006, at which point 900 patients had been enrolled uh, at 100 US sites. Uh, in uh, September 2008, the trial was temporarily suspended uh, and uh, an oversight committee convened to explore issues around consent and uh, the uh, conduct of the study and subsequently uh, those were addressed and the trial was then restarted in June of 2009. You've heard that the uh, number of patients enrolled was 1,708 as opposed to the original sample size of over 2,300 and it is striking that there was difficulty in enrollment despite the increase in the use of this therapy. Uh, the primary composite uh, was death, myocardial infarction, stroke, coronary revascularization, and hospitalization for angina. And I'd like uh, in uh, this slide to remind you that the primary event uh, uh, composite was indeed positive. It consisted of 483 events, uh, and there was an intergroup difference uh, of 39. I'm now showing you uh, what Dr. Lamas has shown you, but in a different format. This, this shows you the, uh, not only the point estimates, but the confidence limits with the vertical line then suggesting unity or the inability to discriminate one from the other. And as you can see, and as he pointed out, the primary endpoint is uh, of marginal significance uh, with about an 18% relative risk as opposed to the original 25% projected. And that's in large part, as you can move your eyes down to the yellow highlight on coronary revascularization, uh, an important but subjective uh, undertaking, that over half of the events, as you can see, the 130, 157 numbers, as opposed to the top numbers of 222 and 261, over half of the events, in fact, were accounted for 
by this uh, undertaking. I want to come back to the issue of diabetes that he has shown you and highlight on the left the primary composite uh, and on the right uh, the patients with diabetics, which uh, uh, constituted almost a third of the overall sample and indeed the large majority of the intergroup difference. I told you that there were 39 uh, events that were different. 35 of those uh, occurred in the diabetic population, uh, an interesting observation of potential biologic plausibility. We have not yet, uh, and I know Dr. Lamas and his colleagues intend to publish this important work, and we look forward to being able to review it in the peer-reviewed literature. So what we're dealing with today is obviously a snapshot of an extraordinary amount of work. And what I would like to know that I do not know today is what the power is to exclude chance, given the sample size, uh, the reduction uh, in the estimated risk ratio, and the p-value of marginal significance, and its ability to accommodate for the frequent interim looks, as he's articulated. I'd like to know whether there's an interaction between the EDTA component of the therapy and high-dose vitamins, because this is a complex uh, 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 therapy. Uh, and indeed, the impact of the very long window of enrollment and the interruption of the trial relative to the length of follow-up, the adequacy of follow-up, compliance, retention, and crossover deserves our attention. And indeed, so too does the comparability and the adequacy of background therapy, not only at the baseline, but over the long period of follow-up in terms of its comparability between the groups. Finally, um, as published on uh, clinicaltrials.gov, the primary endpoint is different than the one that you've seen today. Uh, and uh, coronary re revascularization has been added, and heart failure due to hospitalization, heart failure related hospitalization has been uh, deleted. And we would like to know more about the safety relative to heart failure and uh, renal side effects. The mechanisms of benefit, if they exist, uh, and the logic of the subgroups, especially anterior MI, deserve our consideration. And uh, we will hear more about the impact on quality of life and functional status during this meeting. So my reflections uh, in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, are that this is a diverse, multi-component intervention that we've been uh, uh, presented. There is an absence of a clear uh, biologic rationale. There are several operational methodologic issues that deserve our attention. There's a high proportion of diabetics who dominate the treatment effect. Coronary revascularization is the principal driver and I would comment that it's collinear with the engine of hospitalization in the composite. And I would perceive that these results are hypothesis generating, not practice changing. Thank you.